a very good evening aspirants welcome to hindi news analysis brought to you by shankar ias academy for the date 18th of august 2022 the list of articles we are going to discuss today is displayed on the screen you can go through it Now let's start our discussion with this question. Recently, which of the following states launched Krishi Darshan program? Option A, Bihar. Option B, Maharashtra. Option C, West Bengal. Option D, Kerala. To find the answer for this question, we have to look at this news article. See, the Krishi Darshan program is launched by the Kerala government. So the correct answer here will be option D, Kerala. See, in prelims, UPSC might ask questions relating to some famous regional schemes also. So it is better to be prepared. I ask this question because the program has the word krishi in it. Krishi in Hindi means agriculture that we all know. So people might guess that the program might be from Bihar or UP as Hindi is one of the widely spoken languages in that states. But as we saw the program was launched by the Kerala government. As a part of this discussion let's see a few points about krishi darshan program. Through this program the Kerala government aims to address the issue faced by the farmers. As part of this program the minister for agriculture and senior officials of the agriculture department will interact with the farmers across the state on a regular basis this is done to first listen to the problems faced by the farmers after identifying their problems prompt action will be taken by the government to address them this program is one of the steps taken by the kerala government to achieve self sufficiency in agriculture in the state see it is an innovative program right It is because the first step in this program is identifying the issues with the grassroots by directly interacting with them. This is a bottom-up approach. If properly implemented, this will bring productive change for the farmer. In the main exam also, you can quote innovative schemes like this in the suggestion part or in the way forward part. You can write about how programs like this can be implemented at the national level. Okay. This will show the evaluator that you are up to date with the current affairs okay so that's all regarding this discussion in this news article discussion we saw about a scheme called krishi darshan which was launched by the kerala government with these key learn points let's move on to next news article discussion look at this news article it says that the tiruvananthapuram corporations property tax collection has increased in the current financial year compared to the same period in previous year this is about the article given here In this context let us learn more about the property tax. See first of all what is a property tax? Property tax is sometimes known as house tax. It is the tax which is assessed, imposed and collected from property owners by the relevant municipal authority. See anyone who owns a property or uh, which may be apartment, commercial space or land needs to pay some money to the government authorities in the form of property tax. See the tax is paid to avail basic civil facilities available in and around the property. However, certain categories of properties or certain categories of owners are exempted from paying tax and sometimes they are required to pay at a lower rate compared to others. For instance, agriculture land or property used for worship are exempt from paying property tax. Similarly there is a rebate for property owners who are senior citizens women disabled or differently abled or ex servicemen now let's see how it is calculated know that three methods are used to calculate property tax one of them is capital value system it is levied as a percentage of market value of the property the second one is annual rental value system it is calculated based on the yearly rental value of the property and the third one is unit area value system it is levied on the per unit price of the built up area of the property know that different municipal authorities follow different methods to evaluate property tax now after calculating the amount of tax it is paid annually but some municipal authorities allow semi annual payment also with this knowledge let's see the significance of property tax See property tax are the financial backbone of local governments 
they account for a significant portion of local revenue source. See, the collected amount is mainly used for public services like repairing roads, constructing schools, buildings, sanitation works, etc. Okay, so that's all regarding this news article. In this news article discussion, we saw about property tax and its significance. With these learned points, let's move on to next news article discussion. See this text and context article. This article talks about Arctic amplification. It mainly focuses on three things. First, on the causes of Arctic amplification, then on the consequences of Arctic amplification, and finally, its impact on India. So, in this discussion, let's see all these aspects in detail. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here. In the prelims, the topic we are uh, about to discuss will come under general issues on environmental ecology, biodiversity and climate change. And in the mains perspective, it comes under both paper 1 and paper 3. In paper 1, it comes under changes in critical geographical features and the effects of such changes. And in paper 3, it comes under environmental pollution and degradation. Now let's start the discussion. First of all, what is Arctic amplification? We all know about global warming, right? Global warming is nothing but the long-term warming of the planet's overall temperature. See, warming and cooling of Earth's temperature is not new. But what makes global warming dangerous is that it is caused by anthropogenic changes. So in recent times, due to human activities, the planet's average temperature increased by 1.1 degree Celsius. This 1.1 degree rise is not uniform across the planet. When the average increase in temperature is 1.1 degree, the temperature rise that is happening in the poles is more compared to the rest of the planet. This is called polar amplification. Out of these two poles, the temperature change is even more pronounced in the northern latitudes that is around the Arctic Circle. So, this increased change in temperature due to global warming that happens in the Arctic Circle compared to the rest of the planet is called Arctic Amplification. Okay? See, various studies have shown varying levels of Arctic Amplification. Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program in 2021 states that compared to rest of the planet, the Arctic has warmed three times quicker. So, what causes this quicker warming in the Arctic? Or what causes Arctic amplification? The article highlights three causes for it. They are number one, ice albedo feedback, number two, lapse rate feedback, and number three, water vapor feedback. But to understand this, we must know what is a feedback reaction, and especially we have to know what is a positive feedback. See, friends, feedback reaction is a reaction in which the output of a process influences the input and in turn, it influences the process. Here, positive feedback amplifies the process. To understand positive feedback, let's see an example. Let's see how a person becomes an alcoholic. See, a person does not become an alcoholic in a single day. What happens is that he or she will consume little alcohol initially. But over a period of time, our body starts building tolerance. So, to achieve the same high, he or she will start consuming more alcohol. Then also, our body will develop tolerance to the increased alcohol consumption. So, then he or she will start to consume even more alcohol. Here, due to feedback between the output and the input, the whole process becomes amplified, right? This is called positive feedback. I hope you understood what positive feedback is. And you also understood the ill effects of alcohol. So friends, kindly stay out of alcohol. Now coming back to the discussion, let's first take ice albedo feedback. Now what is albedo? Albedo is the ability of a body to reflect the incoming solar radiation into space, right? And we know that the albedo of a sea ice and snow is higher than water. So due to global warming, when Arctic sea ice starts melting, the albedo in the Arctic region will also come down. Once ice melts and forms water, the water having lower albedo than ice will absorb more solar radiation. This increases the temperature in the region and further amplifies the melting of sea ice. This positive feedback that causes increased warming in the Arctic region is called ice albedo feedback. Now let's take lapse rate feedback. We know what the lapse rate is, right? See, normally with increasing altitude, 
the temperature of the earth's atmosphere will decrease this is called normal lapse rate in the arctic there will be an inverse in lapse rate as the surface temperature is very low due to the presence of sea ice that is in normal conditions in the arctic with increasing altitude temperature does not decrease but increases see the atmosphere of the arctic is highly stratified and due to stratification it will be difficult for a hot parcel of air to rise to the upper atmosphere in the arctic region and due to global warming as sea ice in the arctic starts melting the surface temperature increases the increase in surface temperature results in an increase in evaporation but due to the stratified nature of atmosphere in the poles the hot air finds itself difficult to escape so this will increase the temperature in the ground level further the increasing temperature further increases evaporation but the evaporated air cannot escape further amplifying the heat in the surface thus the loop continues so this is called the lapse rate feedback loop this positive feedback loop is the next important reason for arctic amplification the last important cause for arctic amplification is water vapor feedback to understand this feedback you have to know that water vapor is an important greenhouse gas here also a positive feedback loop is at play what happens here is that with global warming the air temperature increases and we know that hot air can hold more moisture here moisture is nothing but water vapor as water vapor is a greenhouse gas the temperature further increases with increasing temperature air's ability to hold moisture further increases and the positive feedback loop continues this water vapor feedback is another reason for arctic amplification having seen the reasons for arctic amplification now let's see its impacts first major impact is sea level rise the greenland ice shield holds the second largest amount of ice after antarctica with arctic amplification the melting of greenlandic ice has increased this has resulted in increasing sea level second is the change in properties of the arctic sea with arctic amplification the sea surface temperature in the arctic region is increasing this is causing acidification of the ocean as warm ocean can dissolve more carbon dioxide to form weak carbonic acid in addition to this warming oceans and associated melting of the arctic and greenlandic ice has resulted in declining salinity in the region these two factors that is declining salinity and increasing acidity are affecting the marine population in the arctic circle okay the last important impact of arctic amplification is the melting of arctic permafrost see permafrost is a permanently frozen layer on or under earth surface it consists of soil gravel and sand usually bound together by ice the permafrost has naturally sequestered carbon with it due to arctic amplification this permafrost is also melting this results in the release of carbon and methane back into the atmosphere since methane is a greenhouse gas melting of permafrost will further amplify global warming in addition to this there is also the threat of release of long dormant bacteria and viruses that were trapped in the permafrost these new bacteria and viruses might result in new diseases okay these are the three important impacts of arctic amplification see arctic amplification also has some effects on india firstly there is various evidences showing links between rising temperature in the arctic and extreme rainfall from the indian monsoon already the indian monsoon is highly unpredictable with the arctic amplification indian monsoon will further turn erratic since most of india's farm lands are monsoon dependent the arctic amplification will affect agriculture production in india and the next one is regarding sea level rise melting of greenlandic and uh, arctic ice is resulting in sea level rise india has a long coastline and many major cities like uh, mumbai chennai kochi vaishak and uh, kolkata will face the threat of drowning due to rising sea levels so arctic amplification will have a direct impact on india also and uh, that is all regarding this discussion 
here we saw what arctic amplification is and its causes and impacts this is very important from both prelims and mains point of view if you have time please practice answer writing because only the practice will make us to clear the examination okay with these takeaway points let's move on to next news article discussion have a look at this image it is the bada imam bada in lucknow the news is that the special landmark is undergoing some restoration this restoration work is being done as its dome collapsed on monday following heavy rain so in this context let us learn a few facts about bada imam bada see bada imam bada is a imam bada complex in lucknow it was built by asafud daula who was the nawab of lucknow it is also called the asafi imam bada see bada means big and uh, imam bada is a shrine built by shia muslims for the purpose of hasadari here hasadari means the remembrance of muharram and uh, it is a set of commemoration rituals observed primarily by shia people okay now coming back construction of bada imam bada was started in 1785 but note that this 1785 was a year of devastating famine in spite of this asafud daula planned this grand project to provide employment for people in the region for almost a decade so it is majorly built for employment generation and the construction of this imam bada was completed in 1791 see the estimated cost of building this uh, imam bada ranges between half a million rupees to 1 million rupees Even after completion, the Nawab used to spend between four and five hundred thousand rupees on its decoration annually. Let's see some more important facts regarding architecture of Bada Imam Bada. See, Bada Imam Bada has a unique style of construction. The central hall of Bada Imam Bada is said to be the largest arched hall in the world. The hall measures fifty meters long and goes up to a height of fifteen meters. What makes the construction unique is the fact that the blocks have been put together with interlocking system of bricks and there has been absolutely no use of girders and beams the roof stands steady till date without any pillars to support it so the bada imam bada is among the grandest buildings of lucknow the complex also include the largest asifi mosque the bool bulaya and the bauli which is a step well with running water and uh, two imposing gateway lead to the main hall here you can see that so that's all regarding this news article in this news article we saw about bada imma bada and its significance with these learn points let's move on to next news article discussion see this opened page article here it says that only few are all in the service officers who are working in the state are coming forward to work with the center this is because majority of the officers wants to work in their comfort zone of their states they don't want to migrate to the capital region or its neighborhood even for 3 uh, to 5 years to work for the union and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us see the tussle between center and the state over this issue and some important points mentioned in the article before that the syllabus relevant to this article discussion is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it First of all let's see the appointment of all india service officers when i say all india services it means the three civil services of india which is ias ips and indian forest service as we all know the selection process is done through upsc upsc conducts an annual examination which attracts lakhs of applications from the young aspirants and they compete for less than 1000 positions every year this is very well known right We know that civil service examination have preliminary examination, mains examination, and an oral interview. Based on the marks of the written examination and oral interview, candidates are selected. And after the appointment process, the officers are allotted to different states based on the requirement in that respective state. This cadre allocation is based on the cadre review. Every year, three cadre controlling authorities carry out a cadre review. the three authorities are department of personal and training for ias and the home ministry for ips and the environment ministry for indian forest service okay this cadre review gives an assessment of how many new officers are needed to be recruited in each service in each state the review is done in consultation with the state so each state gives the required number of officers to the center 
but here the ultimate decision is taken by the central government and based on this cadre review only the required number of officers in each service is sent to the upsc so when the notification comes out every year with the number of post available it is based on this cadre review only now who appoints them see the officers recruited by the upsc are appointed by the president of india so this means that the appointing authority is the union government after this the selected officers are assigned to the state cadres by the center and after working in the state government up to 9 years the officers can show their willingness to come to the center through their state governments their names are then compiled into a consolidated offer list through which the center can choose officers for vacant post now here only some problems are there one of the problem is unwillingness of the officers to work under the union and the other problem is the tussle between center and the state over this now let's discuss these two issues one by one first of all let's see the reason for unwillingness of the officers one of the main reasons is that the rigor of center's routine that is the harsh working condition in the center the difficulty lies in the long hours of work and uh, there is a need for extreme care in the preparation and submission of reports and the next reason is that the officer need to operate far away from one's native state okay now there is also another reason see to work for the union government at the level of joint secretary and above it is essential for an officer to be enrolled by the center but this enrollment process lacks transparency it allows only a minority of ias officers to be made eligible for senior postings at union so the officers lack interest to work for the union government see these factors should be addressed because there is growing demand for officers in the ministry at the level of deputy secretaries and directors you may say that there is lateral entry for qualified personnel from the public and private sectors but the issue with the lateral entry scheme is that the number of persons recruited through the scheme is too small to make a difference this is because the number of persons recruited through lateral entry is disproportionate to the demand for officers as per the article the case of the indian police service is also equally bad there are many vacancies in the central police establishments comprising the paramilitary forces such as crpf bsf casf cbi and nia see on one hand the demand is growing on the other hand the non ips direct recruits to the paramilitary forces are fighting with the home ministry the fight is to have a greater share of jobs in higher positions see the current cadre rules do not permit such expansion of opportunities for the non ips officers because only ips officers are posted in higher position these are some issues with ips now how can we address the issue see firstly to address the unwillingness of officers for central deputation they should be made aware of the advantages of working for the union some advantages include psychological satisfaction of contributing to the formulation of national policy on many critical issues such as education health care or even the preservation of environment then they should be made aware of the opportunities for foreign travel and a chance to be deputed to work for international agencies secondly to address the issue of mismatch between demand and recruitment many officers should be recruited both by lateral entry and by deputation and for non ips officers career progression should be made attractive steps should be taken to have large number of non ips officers in the higher position now let's see the tussle between center and the state when we saw about the appointment procedure for uh, all in the service officers we saw that the officers are assigned to their respective state cadres by the center and after that the state has complete authority see the state can decide who should be posted in which district and uh, who should be elevated to the level of state secretary and whom to transfer etc okay here the tussle is regarding who has the power here states are not willing to send the officers for central deputation even if the officer is interested the article says that there were instances of unjustified harassment of the officers for instance a distinguished police officer was harassed for reporting to the central government after the state government did not relieve her to join a central organization 
So, what needs to be done to avoid such scenarios? The article says that center is having dialogue with state to amend the All India Service Rules. This amendment will empower the center to take control of the services of any officer serving in the states to work for the center. This will help address the issue of growing demand of posts in different ministries. But we don't know whether state will agree to this or not. But the need of the hour is a stable system of civil services to bolster democratic and responsive public administration in our country. Okay? So that's all regarding this editorial article. In this editorial article, we saw about all in the services. And then we saw who appoints the officers of all in the services. And then we saw the problems associated with central deputation. Finally, we have seen some of the suggestion given by the author of this editorial to rectify this issue. Okay? With these learned points, let's move on to next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. This news article talks about the Saguna and Nirguna Bhakti. These are some forms and approaches to devotion. So in this news article discussion, we will learn about Saguna and Nirguna Bhakti in prelims point of view. See, the term Bhakti refers to devotion. As a movement, it emphasized on the intense emotional attachment and love of a devotee towards God. Okay, this movement originated in South India in 7th and 10th century CE, mostly in the poems of Alvars and Nayanas. These poems were composed in Tamil. See, the poems of Alvars were addressed to Lord Vishnu, while the poems of Nayanas were addressed to Lord Shiva. Okay, then Bhakti soon spread to North India. It appeared most notably in the 10th century Sanskrit text, the Bhagavata Purana. It swept over East and North India from 15th century onwards. It reached the peak between 15th and 17th century CE. Note that the Bhakti science moved against the austerities propagated by the Buddhist and Jain schools. And the Bhakti science professed that ultimate devotion to God was the means to salvation. Okay? See, this movement developed under two different schools of thought. First one is Nirguna Bhakti. It is a belief in formless worship. It was introduced by Adi Shankara. See, the Nirguna worship is very demanding. One should have Samadarsana. That means one should have the ability to view both joy and sorrow with an equal mind. This is possibly only to those who are able to control the senses and the mind. Some Bhakti saints who preached this school of thought are Kabir, Guru Nanak, Dadu Dayal, etc. Now coming to Saguna Bhakti, it believed in the worship of form. It believed that God is the biggest manifestation of everything perfect. See, in Saguna worship, the Lord is omnipresent and they believe that the Lord is present in all beings. He rules each and every aspect of creation. And the one who is able to fix his mind and heart in such a God is known as Bhakta. And note that the Lord's incarnations such as Narasimha, Rama or Krishna are suitable to be the object of their meditation. Worship of the Lord's auspicious qualities is a sure means for salvation for all of them. Some prominent people who belong to Saguna school of thought are Ramanuja, Nimbaraka, Madhava, Vallabha, Mirabai, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Tulsidas, Surdas, etc. Okay, so that's all regarding this news article. In this news article discussion, we saw about Nirguna and Saguna worship. Okay, with these key learned points, let's move on to next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. As the title itself hints, this news article talks about manual scavenging. See, a complaint was made to the Chief Justice of Madras High Court. The complaint was regarding the labourers who were made to remove sewage water right outside the High Court premises. So, taking this as an opportunity, let us quickly go through what is manual scavenging. See, manual scavenging refers to the practice of manually cleaning, carrying, disposing or handling human excreta in any manner. Here, manually means doing it by hand rather than automatically or electronically. It often involves using the most basic of tools such as buckets, brooms and baskets. Now to understand the severity of this practice, we must know a little bit of history about it. See, the practice of manual scavenging in India goes back by a few centuries. Its roots lie deep within the caste-based occupation system in India. 
Under British India also, when the first municipalities were inducted, manual scavengers were employed to collect waste from public toilets. Within a century, these toilets were equipped with the flush system. But by that time, most homes had outhouses or dry latrines that required human scavengers. Whom do you think they used as a scapegoat to perform all these works? Yes, the so-called lower caste were expected to perform this job. That is, the Dalits, who were the lowest in the caste hierarchy, were employed as scavengers. Even within the Dalit community, it is lowest among the sub-caste who undertake scavenging work. Manual scavengers are regarded as unclean, untouchable and face social exclusion and deprivation from multiple dimensions. Finding an alternative vocation was almost impossible. There are three reasons for this. Firstly, this is due to the fact that power and caste hierarchy are intervened in a complex web. For example, most scavengers have inherited the work from their forefathers. Secondly, the economic and social deprivation for generations have given them little opportunity to be trained for something else. Thirdly, those who dared to question the situation were met with social marginalization, exclusion from village resources and in rare cases, they were subjected to physical thrashings. See, despite its dangerous working nature, the sad reality is that manual scavengers, they still prevail amongst the poorest and most disadvantaged communities in India. Now, that does not mean that Indian government did not take any steps. The Employment of Manual Scavengers and Construction of Dry Latrines Act 1993 formally prohibited the construction of dry latrines and employment of manual scavengers. The National Commission for Safai Karamcharis Act 1993 was a welfare legislation passed to monitor implementation of scheme for sanitation workers and also addresses their grievances. However, it was only in 2013, both houses of the parliament unanimously passed the prohibition of employment as manual scavengers and their rehabilitation act which outlawed the practice of manual scavenging completely. Now talking about this act, it is an umbrella legislation that aimed to look at the issue holistically. This act prohibits the employment of manual scavengers, construction of dry latrines and manual cleaning of septic tanks and sewers without protective equipments. It became the first legislation that identified the links between scavenging as a profession and social caste hierarchy. And it also became the first act that placed the responsibility on the owners to demolish dry latrines and build proper toilets. The act overrides all previous state laws on manual scavenging. There is a strong vigilance mechanism in place and offences under this act are non-bailable. It is also the first legislation to have some concrete notion on rehabilitation of manual scavengers. Additionally, articles like Article 14 which is about right to equality and Article 17 which is regarding abolition of untouchability, Article 21, 42 and 46 of the Constitution of India may be invoked for these issues. This further strengthens the constitutional right of a person to seek justice. See, despite so many legislations, the practice still continues. Now, why this practice is still prevalent in India? As we all know, the first reason is the social issue. As I already said, the practice is driven by caste, class and income divides. Even though in 1993, India banned the employment of people as manual scavengers, the stigma and discrimination associated with it still linger on. Even if they want to leave their profession, their untouchability and uncleanliness tag and the resultant social stigma makes it impossible for them to find alternate jobs. Secondly, manual scavenging exists mainly due to continued presence of unsanitary latrines where human waste has to be cleaned physically rather than by machine or sewage system. The majority of such unsanitary latrines are dry latrines that don't use water. Third important reason is the continued reluctance on the part of the state governments to admit that the practice prevails under their watch. Apart from this, poor enforcement of existing laws is also a reason for annual scavenging. Though the construction of dry latrines has drastically reduced, the number of deaths in manholes, sewers and septic tanks continues to remain high. So what can be done to address the issue? Firstly, there should be proper identification of the workers. States need to accurately enumerate the workers engaged in cleaning toxic sludge. 
secondly schemes like the swachh bharat abhiyan should make expansion of the sewer network as a top priority and it should come up with a scheme for scientific maintenance that will end the manual cleaning of septic tanks thirdly there is a need for social sensitization see to address the social sanctions behind manual scavenging it is required first to acknowledge and then understand how and why manual scavenging continues to embedded in the caste system okay then it has to be sensitized fourthly there is a need for a stringent law if a law creates a statutory obligation to provide sanitation services and part of the state agency it will create a situation in which the rights of this worker will not hang in the air lastly the law should be enforced vigorously to eliminate manual scavenging in the country apart from this there should be trials and testing of protective gears provided to the sanitary workers okay so that's all regarding this news article in this news article we saw about manual scavenging why it is prevalent in india and some of the ways to address manual scavenging in india okay with all these learned points let's move on to next part of our news article discussion which is preliminary practice questions discussion look at the first question consider the following statements bada ima bada consists of 1000 pillars to support its large roof statement 2 it was constructed by asafud daula who was the nawab of lucknow okay we have to find the correct statement here regarding statement 1 it is incorrect because in our discussion itself we saw that the uniqueness of the building is its pillarless roof it is because of the interlocking system of bricks there were no requirements of girders and beams and statement 2 it is correct the nawab constructed is to provide job to his people during the period of famine look at the second question it is regarding property tax statement 1 a property of central government is liable to pay property tax statement 2 vacant properties are liable to pay property tax we have to find the correct statement here see here both the statements are incorrect because central government properties and vacant properties are generally exempted from property taxation okay so here our answer will be option d neither one nor two look at this question this question is a quiz question for you this is a very easy question if you have listened to our discussion today you can easily answer this question find the answer and post it in the comment section the main question based on today's discussion is displayed on the screen you can write your answer and post it in the comment section i will definitely review and tell you my feedback if you like the video hit the like button post your comments and share the video with your friends and don't forget to subscribe shankar ias academy youtube channel thanks for watching